Well, I thought um, what I'm going to do is talk to these fine esteemed gentlemen first for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes maybe, and get them going. And then I want to throw the uh, questions open to you, the audience, and um, we want this conversation to be provocative and lively. So particularly the provocative and lively questions to them and not to me. Uh, the, 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 the question was put, has the culture of celebrity become corrosive? It's all pervading. I've been a journalist now for... 30 years. When I started out, the celebrity was the royal family. Uh, the royal family are now B-listers, frankly, compared to um, St. Jade, who, of course, Max Clifford had a big hand in, and the sort of people who dominate Hello and uh, Closer and those sort of magazines. So we want to look at the rise and rise of these celebrities and examine, in your view, the panel's view, whether it's been a good or bad thing. Um, if I could start with you, Max. Um, you are the most probably publicly associated face of celebrity. Are you surprised by how much it has grown and grown? Um, yes, I am surprised because it's mostly much to do about very little. Uh, but it's a whole industry now in this country in which um, there's more and more people determined to be famous and you know, want to be famous. And the media uh, ever more playing their part because it makes it money because obviously they can write about the new celebrities that keep coming and going all the time and so they feed off each other but uh, as someone that's never been interested in celebrities I suppose I'm not surprised yet. Much about very little, <laughs> so. Yeah. so that's quite a dismissive. Well, no, I started out in 1962 helping launch an unknown band called The Beatles. They had to I then launched, helped to launch Hamlet Motown with Smokey Robinson and Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye and The Temptations and people like that. They had to. Smokey Robinson, who created Hamlet Motown, the very Gordy, was a great songwriter as well as an artist. So my first 20 years in the business, from then to Sinatra to Muhammad Ali to all the people I worked with, was all about people that had undoubted talent in different areas. In the last 20 years, particularly in the last 10 years, there's more and more people that have become famous with absolutely no talent at all. Can you name some names? Well, Jade had no talent. She was the first to she had no talent. She was just herself. So Jade would be a very good example of that. You, you, you list those uber names like Frank Sinatra and the Beatles, but you came to prominence, right or wrongly, with your promotion of Freddie Starr with a memorable headline, Freddie Starr, Ain't My Answer. Well, that's actually not true. Um, I was extremely well known and established all over the world for looking after the stars I looked after long, long, long before Freddie Starr. They, Freddie Starr, might have been a step in me becoming more uh, known to the public. Well, that was 1986. You know, I'd already been working then for, uh, for some of my 25 years, very successfully promoting stars, companies, organisations worldwide. Um, the fact that I'd never ever pitched for business from day one, people knew me. So, in terms of the public, maybe Freddie Star was a step. But in America, I was far better known for working with the Beatles and Frank Sinatra than Freddie Star. Because in America, no one's heard of Freddie Star. So maybe over here, um, you know, that played a part. Let's go to you, Mark Bukowski. You've written a book, The Fame Formula. It's essentially a guide on how to be just that. See, I've given you the book twice, if you still haven't read it. Actually, what it is, it, the end part of the book looks at the, the timing effect. Max and I talked about, talked about that briefly. But, it really, I, I wanted to put in context the fame makers, the people who had actually built the celebrity, and therefore the celebrity which we've got to now. And I concur with Max to a certain extent that you have got an industry that's changed. But then, <coughs> the, all the publicists, the history of the publicists, particularly in the movies, recognised talent and they worked with talent. It wasn't the fabulous nobodies we get that become fabulous somebodies. They genuinely had talent. And to some extent, for a big portion of the book, I look at the, the way that 
some of the negativity was held back. We now feast, the media feast on the negatives. All that was kept kept back because what the public were offered were stars they worshipped and they kept them alive, they kept the business alive. And the studio system, particularly in the movie business, was specifically about that, about taking the collateral that they had of their stars and monetizing it. Now what happened at the end of the, the end of that, that period is as they broke up and they became more freelance publicists like Warren Carroll, Henry Rogers, um, and the industry built up, the population industry started to pick up pace in that space. Then more people got involved with it, taking, you know, with agents trying to project stars rather than vehicles. And it's come full circle to that now where the television companies need vehicles, need, need these things that they need people to join in to take part in. So to a certain extent, we've become more interested in the soap opera that goes behind the individual rather than focusing on the great huge talent that they've got. And therefore, there is time for that. You've got about, if you have no talent, you've got about 15 months to make what you can, and then you've got to do something else. You've got to connect, you've got to do another publicity study, be connected to the record release or whatever, to re-engage that interest. And what people tend to do is do virtually anything to re-engage, because that life, supposedly, is more important than anything else because they become addicted to the headlines, they become addicted to the process. And we, you know, are more interested, as I said, that soap opera, so where, where people walk up Max's stairs in Mayfair, um, they clearly want to be part of that. And if there wasn't an interest in that, this is what I would say, people say, oh, you know. If there wasn't an interest in that from the media, from the public, they would go away. We'd be looking at something more substantive, but that's changed. You talked, to, uh, you talked about stars, because they were stars, those publishers were having earlier. Celebrities are not stars. There is a difference, and you make that point in your book. Yeah, I do. I think, I think there's, a, there's a big distinction. We, we, we've moved away from that. Um, and there isn't, there isn't the vehicles. There, there isn't the investment that we put into that. Max talks about the Beatles or Tamil Motown or whatever. People you know, took risks with people, and they didn't expect them to be a hit overnight. They would give him a chance to flip him. Didn't have hits. He had some hits. He had some failures. Nowadays, people were rejecting those because he can't it through the earth, and they need returns on that. They need money to return on that. So they're not going to stay in someone's career because it's not valuable for them. They're going to get the investment back. I think you'd agree with that. Cliff, you'd have been Cliff for, for years. I mean, the sense of could we create another Cliff Richard? Something had to happen. Generally, well, that's an interesting question about Cliff Richard because uh, the media has been obsessed about Cliff Richard's sexuality, but it's never been written about. Uh, and, and I've no idea what his sexuality is, and I'm not interested. If it started, <laughs> if, if Cliff started out today, do you think, Max Clifford, it's possible that in 10 or 15 years somebody wouldn't have come to your door and said, boy, that nice, sneaky, clean, happy, crappy Christian image he conveys doesn't fit in with the fact he or she, I stress, had a raucous night of raunchy sex with them. 